Boys University! University of Virginia! Villanova University! Georgetown University! All right, yes, prep! Good morning! What a great morning. My name is Jason Bernal. I'm the CEO of Yes Prep Public Schools. And on behalf of the entire Yes Prep community, it is my honor and privilege to welcome you to the most inspiring day of the year, Yes Prep Senior Signing Day. As always, I'd like to uh, welcome our founder back to Houston, Chris Barbick. Thank you for coming. To all of you, thank you for being at Senior Signing Day to celebrate the accomplishments of these incredibly talented students. And now listen to this. Our seniors have submitted more than 3,937 applications to 322 colleges across the country. And they have received more than $16 million in scholarships. And 90% of our students are the first generation college bound. And I am here today to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Dr. Lauda Murillo. Dr. Murillo is president and CEO of the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. With the support of the Houston Chamber board and staff, she has set unprecedented records, including having this chamber be the largest Hispanic chamber in the entire country. She also serves as the founding president and CEO of the Chamber's Foundation, the founding host and producer for the Chamber's television program on CBS Channel 11 and on Univision. Did I say that right? She holds a BA, a master's degree, and a PhD from the University of Houston. Go Cougars! where she served as an executive in addition to serving as an executive at the Memorial Hermann Hospital in the Texas Medical Center. Her alma mater, the University of Houston, most recently bestowed its highest honor, the President's Medallion, to the Chamber and to Dr. Murillo. She has received many state, national, and even international awards, including being named among the most powerful and influential women in Texas, by the National Diversity Council. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> Women of the Year by Success Magazine and the International Leadership Award by Texas Women's Empowerment Foundation. Dr. Murillo was also named among the top 10's Who's Who by Houston Business Journal and the National Football League recently honored her with the Hispanic Leadership Award. She gives back to her community as a board member of several organizations, including the Houston Symphony's Hispanic Leadership Council and the Mayor's Hispanic Advisory Board. We are excited to add keynote speaker of the 2015 Yes Prep Senior Signing Day to your uh, resume. Please join me on stage, Dr. Murillo. Thank you so much for today. What a fantastic opportunity to be before you here on this very special signing day. For those of you who are ready to move on to college, congratulations to you. Congratulations to your families. I want to talk to you about a man and a woman who crossed the Rio Grande when they were teenagers. They crossed with a child, came to this country with no money, no education, and knew no one in this country. They went on to have nine children, came here. She dedicated her life to her children. He laid tile for many, many years, went on to become a restaurateur. His first paying job paid him 50 cents an hour. 
His hands grew tired as he worked to feed nine children. She, as I mentioned, dedicated her life to her children. These people that crossed the Rio Grande, who eventually became permanent residents of this country, came here to provide their children with a better life. And I know because I am the youngest of those nine. Those were my parents. I can stand before you today because of three reasons. People, passion, and persistence. Those three things will carry you on well beyond signing day, well beyond yes prep. I encourage you to surround yourself with people who are smarter, stronger than you. As my father would say to me, Laura, make sure the people that you are with are smart, are passionate, and are committed to living a good life. Secondly, be persistent. Be persistent. Nothing will come easy to you, but with persistence, I guarantee a no may mean no now, but may turn into a yes later. And the, the third characteristic that I believe will empower you is that of passion. Your passion will help you overcome obstacles, whether it be people, circumstances. That passion will make sure that you excel to levels you never thought you could excel. Remember that. People, persistence, and passion can take you wherever you choose to go. In the Texas Medical Center Memorial Hermann, there were 20,000 employees at Memorial Hermann. There were two Hispanic executives. I was one of those two Hispanic executives. So when I was recruited away and asked to take the job as president and CEO of the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, it was a small nonprofit. We had 300 members. We had no money. We had challenges. But in my heart, my passion told me that with the right people and with persistence, that Hispanic Chamber of Commerce could grow to become the largest in the country. And it did. And remember, you'll do nothing by yourself. You will need the right people in your life. You will need persistence, and you will need passion. When we were seeking to try to produce a television show, for three years, we were told no. But remember, my father taught me to be persistent. Today, we don't have a television show. We have two television shows. We have six CBS radio stations that carry our coverage. And remember when I told you that I worked at the University of Houston for 15 years and then I worked in the Texas Medical Center for eight years? At that time, I wanted to be vice president of something, anything. And it didn't happen. And I was discouraged because I worked hard, just like my father did. I worked very hard. But rather than be discouraged, I kept working. I kept praying. I was more persistent. I was more passionate. And I surrounded myself by smart, strong people. But you know what? Sometimes we have dreams. And those dreams just don't come true. But you know what? Sometimes there's a bigger plan. And while I never became vice president of anything, I did become president and CEO of the largest Hispanic chamber in the country. I went to school full time. I worked full time. I maintained an A average. 
was pregnant with the second child when my mother had a massive heart attack and was told she would not live more than three days. Now, when I say pregnant, I mean very pregnant. <laughs> and I had every reason to withdraw from school and postpone or not move forward with my doctorate. But my father didn't teach me that. When they crossed the Rio Grande, they came here, they started a life. Shame on me. Shame on me for even thinking that I might not complete my doctorate. I took my notebooks, my pregnant self, and sat outside while my mother lay in ICU for days. And even though the doctor said she would not live, I knew in my heart that my mother was a fighter and that she would live and that she would want me to stay in school. And I studied and I studied. And to get your doctor, one of the most difficult classes you have to take is your comprehensive exams, which included for me statistical analysis. And that particular year, 40 of us took the exam, four of us passed. And we would study in a little group in the mornings on Sundays from 8 to 11. And people would say, it's OK, Laura. You can take the test again. It's OK, Laura. You're pregnant. Your mother's ill. Come back next semester. But I was not going to give up. When everyone left at 11, I ate lunch, a big lunch, because I was pregnant. <laughs> and I stayed in that library until 10 o'clock when it closed. I would wake up at 4 in the morning to make sure that our first daughter was fed, ready to go. I'd go to the hospital, I'd come back to work. I got a promotion during that time. And then I got a phone call. The phone call was from the dean of the University of Houston, and he said, congratulations, Laura. You were one of four to pass the comprehensive examinations. And I couldn't believe it, so I asked him to check my Social Security number. He said, we checked twice. You passed. Congratulations, Dr. Laura Murillo. Soon thereafter, my mother was able to see me graduate, and our youngest daughter was born. And my message to you today is, again, nothing is given. Everything must be earned. And that hard work that you put in today will reap large dividends. But you will have challenges. You will have obstacles. It's what is within you to move forward. So I stand before you today as someone who has had challenges and obstacles. But remember, through people, passion, and persistence, you are in control. You define the possible. So as the daughter of immigrant parents who had only a second grade education, I stand before you today in a position where I have the grand opportunity to speak with, to have the ear of, presidents, governors, CEOs, and very important people who make decisions that impact the lives, not only of Latinos, but of Houstonians. And it is my distinct honor to have the opportunity to congratulate you today. And to those of you who are seated, still on your trek to this floor, this journey of Yes Prep. From my heart, I wish you well. 
I ask you to please continue to redefine the possible, just as I've been blessed to redefine the possible. Good morning, my name is J.K. McAndrews. I'm President and CEO of Mass Mutual Greater Houston. We're proud to be a sponsor of the inaugural Women's Leadership Conference. Hope you have a great day. Hi, I'm Tangie Napier, Vice President of Retail Delivery for TDECU. And I'm so happy to be a part of this event today, the first inaugural women's conference hosted by the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for making us a part of this event. We always appreciate being a part of shaping the young minds in our city. Have a great day. Enjoy. to these women, each of them extraordinary. I want to talk to you a little bit about a book that um, is out there, and it uh, talks about the problem is not that women achieve lower outcomes when they negotiate. It's just that women do not negotiate the way men do. Some do, not all. Talk to us, Mary, about that particular point, and then we're going to go to your other questions that we've got for you. I think women do negotiate differently. I think that um, we try to be very good listeners, which is what it takes to be a, a very effective negotiator. And sometimes men, pardon me guys, but I, I do have my feelings about gender. And I think men grow up and they all think they're Superman. And I think women as a rule, we're, we're calculated risk takers. So we're a little bit, we take a little bit more time before we just leap out there. So in a negotiating stance, I think we try to be more thoughtful in what we do. We make it a fact-based presentation to make our point, to try to get that point across. And so I think we're different. We don't just blurt it out. And we are different. You're absolutely right. One of the things that I always say is that once you're at the table, don't just sit there. So what are you doing at that table that's going to really, as you said, help other people who have that opportunity, whether you're the, the first man at the table or the youngest at the table, give them guidance on what you do once you are there. And I think that's the key. I agree completely, Mary, that you set your path, you decide what you want to do, you do your best, but we do have an obligation, every one of us, to make sure that we're aware of what we're talking about, that we're bringing up concepts right. that others may not be at the table to bring up. Devra. Tell your story, Dira. I started a business back in 1996, and I always had a heart to help people. I started this business not knowing anything about the healthcare industry, but uh, had a heart to help people. Had a relationship with my grandmother and, her gran and my grandmother friends, and I would take them to doctor visits and take them to the store and get their grocery uh, list done and all that great stuff. And I uh, discovered, while I was working uh, at the Department of Human Service, discovered that it was actually a program, uh, I thought, that uh, provided these services. And I said, hey, this is the same thing I'm doing for my grandmother. You know, let me go ahead and see if I can apply to do this. And long story, fast forward, um, went through the application, found out, got assessed, went through this process, got assessed, and found out that I could not contract for the government and work for the government. So it put me in a position where I had to make a choice you know, as women, we have to make choices sometime in life, and we have to make those choices by faith. And so I decided to step out on faith and quit my good government job with all the benefits and say, hey, this is something that I really feel passionate about and something that I really, really believe that it's part of my purpose and part of my calling in life. And so I stepped out on faith and uh, quit my good government job and thought uh, business was going to come right away, Laura. It was two years before I got my first client. Right. Two long years without a paycheck, two whole years. And so I went through this process of being broke, not understanding what happened, um, not understanding, I'm thinking, you know, as uh, entrepreneurs, we think, you know, you go out and purchase business cards, you go out and get a DBA, and business is gonna come right away. Okay, it's not true <laughs> in my, <laughs> was not true in my situation. Look, y'all, I was broke. I mean, I was like so broke. I mean, you walk by the uh, ATM machines and alarms would trick out. I was just that broke. <laughs> I was broke. She's not broke today. That's all that matters. Nope. <laughs> 
No, I am not broke. And fast forward, I have over 800 employees yes, throughout the state of Yes, she does. Give her a round of applause. This is amazing. amazing. Doing a phenomenal job. I love what I do. I love living life on purpose, and I'm growing. And I love what you said about us uh, bringing along other women entrepreneurs. Yes. And I believe, I mean, I think for me, it's about the purpose and the passion that you really have to be an entrepreneur because it's not about the money. You can't be motivated with money, right. but you have to be motivated from a place deeper. Be there. Be there. Be present. There are 73 million women in the labor force today. 73 million. And when you look at that number, that's pretty darn impressive, isn't it? Yes, it is. When you start to peel back the onion, though, you look at that and you say, okay, that's less than half of the women that could be in the labor and workforce. And so how big a voice or vote do you get into how fast women are moving up the leadership ladder? With, with that, uh, with that uh, metric. 80% of the men are in the labor force. So obviously they're gonna get a pretty strong voice. When you start to look at it, let me use a coach's uh, metaphor. It says that when half the team is on the bench, are you gonna win? In 1980, there were no women in top executive ranks of Fortune 100 companies. By 2001, 11% of those company leaders were women. What are some of the things that the women in this room can do to prepare for that next level of leadership at the C level, at the table, Hanato? There's 3% representation of women on Fortune 500 boards in the US. And oh, by the way, when I read the statistics, they were talking about all the progress we had made. Clearly, Lauda mentioned in 1980, there were none. So yes, there's progress, but 3% is, is pretty sad. And then of course when you break down women into different ethnic groups and you, you see that 1% that, uh, uh, of, of the, the total seats are, are occupied by Latinas, it's even sadder. Now, um, okay, so there's a lot of doom and gloom uh, in terms of representation, but, but it's clear that there are mandates in certain sectors to, to increase uh, representation. When you consider uh, some of the programs out there, educational programs for training, some of the corporate programs, I mean, just look at the, if you want to know which companies are hiring, are looking for diversity, look at the people who are sponsoring events like this, supporting Lauda, supporting the Houston Hispanic Chamber. Those are the companies that are hiring and diversifying uh, among minority groups and among uh, um, um, genders that, that are underrepresented. Hector, talk to us about the percentage of women who voted in the last mayoral election. In politics, the rule of thumb is that if you have 50% plus one of the vote, you, can, you have the power to determine who wins. When you look at the actual uh, charts, uh, I created a chart called percent of the vote comprised by females in Harris County November elections by each group. And at the bottom, it gives you three elections because we're always talking about various elections. Presidential elections, there's three kinds of elections. Presidential elections, municipal elections, and midterm elections. So when you actually look at the, the uh, results, you find that in the 2012 presidential election here in Harris County, women constituted 54.2% of the vote. So you have 50% plus one. You have the power to determine who represents uh, you at every level of government. You know, as we've talked today, we realize that women make up the majority of the workforce at 51.8%. Here's the great news. We are earning almost 60% of undergraduate degrees and more than 60% of all the master's degrees, we are getting an education at a much higher rate. That's progress. We earn 47% of all law degrees. And get this, 48% of all medical degrees. That's phenomenal for our daughters, for our children. <laughs> Yet, we lag behind in representation at leadership levels. There are only 14% of executive officers, 8% of top earners, and 
4.6% of Fortune 500 are women CEOs. So we're making gains, but we're lagging behind. And to the men, I'm going to say it again, don't be afraid to pass the ball. Be that force of change. Let the women at the table, don't drop the bar for us. Keep it right where you have it, and we'll jump over the bar. Just let us know. Now, although women control 80% of consumer spending, listen to that. We control 80% of the spending. 80%. The decision is ours. But get this, in the realm of advertising, and I know we have women in that particular profession here today, at leadership levels, women only represent 3%. So who are those bold leaders out there who will say, women are making the decisions, maybe we should get their feedback and get them on our boards, get them to run our corporations. So as we look at the global perspective, we see that Finland, Iceland, Norway, they lead the way. They have respectively 43, 40, 40% 40 of the female legislators. They're getting it. They're making that change. You see women running countries, even some Latin American countries. When will we get to that point here in this country? When? We ask you all to, co to consider also the percentage of women running for office has increased steadily. But in what was called the Year of the Woman in 1992, when the number of women in the Senate suddenly doubled from two to four, we were supposed to be so very excited. <laughs> As we look at a series of historic wins, 40% of Americans now have at least one woman representing them in the U.S. Senate. And we are happy to report that today, there are no longer any male-only state legislatures. And yet women today only hold 18.5 of congressional seats and they are just 20% of all U.S. Senators, only 10% of governors. They hold only 24.2% of state legislative seats and only 12% of the mayors in the 100 largest American cities are women. So as you can see, we have much more work to do. On it.